pleased to have back on the Rich Eisen Show the man himself, Mike Mayock. How are you there, Mike? I'm doing pretty well, Rich. How about you? I'm doing fine. So I had David Cornwell on at the beginning of the first hour. He said no player coming out of the college ranks is ready to be an NFL player off the field. Would you agree with that, Mike? No, I wouldn't agree that no player. I think there are plenty of players that, um, even first-round guys, that can withstand, uh, that, that are more, uh, and it, it all depends on your background and how savvy you are to certain situations. But, yeah, I think there there's a, a percentage of players that can handle being an NFL player, and I think we've seen that over the years. And, Rich, but I'd take it a step further. I, I feel badly that he was quoted the way he was, I mean, it was taken, the context came from Villanova University at a seminar. Mm -hmm. And I had two friends at the seminar who were there went and listening to the whole thing. And I, I, I know what he's saying. And uh, I, A, was I surprised that he said it in that kind of seminar three weeks before the draft? Yeah, a little bit. But I think he was just trying to be honest on the topic, which was, you know, Jameis Winston does have to grow up. We all know that. That's not a newsflash. <laughs> you, you know, and there, there are a lot of players that need the infrastructure and help of the league and the team, and most importantly, that locker room and mentors and coaches. But um, I, think, I think a lot of it's got kind of blown out of proportion. And at the end of the day, I believe, even though I have the Oregon kid number one, I believe that he's a great fit for Tampa Bay. I'd be surprised if they don't take him. Winston is the great fit for Tampa Bay, you mean? Well, I, I do believe that, yes. I, I mean, if you look at their offense with Vincent Jackson and Michael Evans, and they want to play jump ball outside the numbers. They need a big, strong-arm, drop-back quarterback, throw the back shoulder throw. I mean, I, I think he fits what they want to do, and I'd be very surprised if they didn't take him. I mean, my top five by position or more my reflection than really who I think Tampa is going to take. Mike Mayock joining me here on the Rich Eisen Show. So since we're putting things into context here, um, I, I, you know, I always listen to you, Mike. I always hear you, too. And I always, you know, I've been around you for years now, over a decade. The fact that you've dropped Winston and put Mario to number one with this much time to go, because you mentioned it a couple of times at the draft, I mean, at the combine, and I heard you in the NFL uh, on, on path to draft and total access to. Manziel and what happened to him after where you put him on your draft board last year, does that factor in to what you've done with Winston this year, Mike? A little bit, and I, and I think, Rich, as an evaluator, you always want to critique yourself. And I've learned a couple lessons at the quarterback position over the years, and, and I was disappointed in myself last year. Um, I'm fairly conservative by nature. I kind of allowed myself to get caught up into the, oh, you know, I love his on-the-field tape. He can be Doug Flutie. He can be Fran Tarkenton. He can be Russell Wilson. And, and he's just, you know, he's an immature kid that will grow up. And, what I should have done is what I usually do with those kind of circumstances, and that is when a kid has a repeated pattern of bad off-the-field decisions, at some point he usually continues them, especially when he gets comfortable in the NFL or the NBA or baseball or wherever. So I'm a little mad at myself or disappointed in myself, maybe is a better word, um, from last year. And, and you kind of, especially at the quarterback position, I think you have to be even more conservative about it. Despite all that, you, you, you believe the Bucks are going to still take Winston number one overall? Well, I, I, all signs have, have seemed to indicate it up to this point, Rich. Sure. And this is the point, as you and I both know, where, you know, disinformation is the food of the day. And who knows what to believe or not to believe. I just kind of trust my own sense from a football perspective. I think he fits what they do. I think they want him to fit what they do. Um, and, you know, if they went Mariota, you know, would I, would I be shocked? No, but I do really, I do believe that as long as they get the okay from ownership, that's the direction they're going. So the Titans at two, what do you think they do? Does Mariota go there? Um, what do you think the Titans do at two? I, I think that's the intrigue of the whole draft. If, if, you know, if, if Jameis goes one, then at two, you sit there, and, and they could go a bunch of different ways. I think it's really intriguing because all of a sudden the leak about Mettenberger, 
You know, if you're in that building, you want to believe Mettenberger's your guy because, you know, do you want to go draft another young quarterback and go through all those growing pains with another quarterback? Well, you know, maybe, if it, but only if you believe he's a significant upgrade over the guy in your building. You have to believe that Mariota or Winston is significantly better long-term than Zach Mettenberger. If you're not sure about that at all, then you're either going to take Leonard Williams, who really fits what you do. And by the way, they, you know, they signed Derek Morgan, re-signed him, and then they signed Arakbo, so their edge is good. Leonard Williams fits them like a glove. So he makes sense for them, or... The intrigue of the trade yes. now makes a ton of sense. You bet, Mike. I would, you know where I was going next. There's a lot of smoke now. The question is, is there a fire in San Diego? Is this a situation where the Titans grab Mariota too, and you and I are sitting there with David Shaw, by the way, and Mooch inside uh, the, uh, the draft inside the Roosevelt College Auditorium, where we're looking at each other, waiting to hear there's been a trade. And San Diego flips Phillip Rivers to Tennessee to reunite Phillip with the offensive coordinator uh, a couple years ago in San Diego, who's now the head coach there in Ken Wisenhunt. Do you see that at being a fire with all this smoke, Mike? If you put yourself in Tennessee's shoes, okay, I would prefer a trading partner that could trade me a veteran quarterback plus draft picks if possible. That would be my preference if I'm. Um, Rustin Webster and Ken Wisenhunt, as opposed to just pure draft picks. So if I'm Tennessee and I could get Phillip Rivers, are you kidding me? <laughs> In a heartbeat, I'm moving. Okay? And if I pick up a pick or two and on the side, that that's awesome. Um, but also, I mean, just keep it. I, I would want a trading partner that could help me with a veteran quarterback as opposed to moving from, say, two to five or two to six or two to seven. You know, I, I want a veteran quarterback. Um, and if you connect the dots, yeah, there's some intri- intriguing stuff there. You know, and Chip Kelly has got Sam Bradford. He's got a, a longer way to go, but there's not a huge difference between 17 and 20. Do you really so, think that Bradford's a trading chip or, or chips – that this is his guy. I think he, this is his guy. And just some Philly fans can't wrap their arms around the fact that he's pointed to a player in the NFL and said, that's my guy, finally, at the quarterback spot, and it's Sam Bradford. Mike, where do you stand on that? The only thing I've learned about Chip Kelly in two years, and I know him a little bit now, it's, the only thing I know about him is that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll... I'm, I'm done trying to figure – I mean, he's a really – he's a smarter guy than I am, and I've got no shot at figuring out what he's doing. Um, you know, the, the move he made with Shady McCoy to the linebacker, which I understood what he was doing, and then, and then okay, to Marco Murray, but not, why Ryan Matthews also, especially when they re-signed Chris Polk? You know, I mean, I'm intrigued, as is the entire league to watch Chip Kelly over the next couple years. So who's the most special player? Who do you think is the guy with the best shot that years from now, because you know we always talk about it's a three- to five-year wait to find out how good somebody is. Yeah. Um, who do you think we're going to be pointing to in this draft and say, that's the guy, that was the guy, that is the guy now in the NFL? Mike? Well, I, I think the easiest guy to pick as that guy is Leonard Williams. He reminds me a lot of... Richard Seymour, when he came out and drafted, I think, number six overall, the Patriots, a little bit of J.J. Watt. And the reason I say those two guys is their natural five techniques, which is that 3-4 defensive end, which with Ray Horton, now the defensive coordinator, is where Tennessee's at. Um, but they're, he's a natural five technique that can play up and down the line of scrimmage with, with strength, with speed. He's kind of a no-brainer, I think, as long as he continues to want to be the best player. And the guy that I'm really intrigued by is Dante Fowler from Florida, who I knew nothing about before I put the first tape in. And I, and I love when, you, when your spider sense starts tingling a little bit. You put the tape and you're like, oh, man, look at that. And then, wow, look at that. And, oh, he just said a violent edge. Look at that. And it was a lot like Khalil Mack for me a year ago where wow. I got pumped up, as you know, about Khalil Mack. Yep. I, felt, I felt the same way about Dante Fowler. Huh. Before I let you go, Mike, um, many people might not know this about you, but then again, it's 
every time we chat, every time you go on television in a way, certainly with the network, we learn a little bit more about you, certainly with the whole Sugar Hill gang at the uh, Combine. <laughs> you're, a, you're, you're a golf guy. You love the sport. You play it. You're, uh, you're a member at a prestigious uh, facility. I don't know if I, you can mention it if you want. Um, what what'd you think of the Masters? What would you think of Jordan Spieth, Mike? Well, I mean, by way of background, I, I grew up hitchhiking it out of West Philadelphia to, to, to caddy at Marion Golf Club. Mm-hmm. And my four younger brothers all caddied there. Also, we had five Mayox caddy at Marion. And if they knew that, I probably wouldn't have gotten in. There you go. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but unfortunately, I never played the game until I was in, in my mid to late 20s, so I stink. But it gives me a better appreciation for how good these guys are. And, and Jordan, I kept I'm watching yesterday and trying to see if anybody's going to chase. I mean, the natural drama of sports is amazing. You know, it doesn't matter what the sport is. And, and you're wondering how a 21 year old kid is going to react to Phil Mickelson chasing down his throat. And every time the kid slipped a little bit, he came back with an incredible shot. And to me, you just take your hat off to any athlete under fire that reacts positively in that kind of situation. I thought it was awful. And how come there's no one wringing their hands over the fact that he left school early? How come, you know, we had Coach K on last week, and, you know, he was talking about he'd hated the term rent a players and, and one and done people. And he said, look, we're, basketball and football is treated differently. Right? Spieth, Spieth is a 21-year-old. We're all just singing his praises, how great it is. No one's sitting there thinking, well, he didn't get an education at Texas. He left early. Right, Mike? It's a double well, standard. I, yeah, you, you know, I think there has to be some common sense that goes with that. And I agree with you 100%. And in, in America, we all have a right to earn a living at a certain age. Right? Mm -hmm. So I get it and I support it. My only caveat with football players is that as opposed to golfers or baseball players or basketball players, if they choose to pursue their livelihood at age 18 or 19, I'm fine with it. If a, if a, if a football player tries to go in the NFL at age 18, his body isn't developed. I'm scared to death the kid's going to get killed. And every once in a while, an 18-year-old may be able to survive. But he, he's the aberration and not the norm. And I think we have to protect from a bunch of... 18-year-old high school football players that think they're good enough to play in the NFL. And I think that brings us full circle with whether you, whether most of these kids coming out of wherever they're coming out of are ready for life as a professional in the National Football League, Mike. It's sort of interesting. <laughs> well, that's what you're good at, Rich. You're, you're really good because I leave all kinds of stuff out there hanging, and you just kind of tie it up in a concentric little circle, and we're good to go. <laughs> That's why we work together, Mike. I can't wait to get there to Chicago and hang with you. I can't wait. This is going to be a blast. Yeah, I appreciate it, Rich. Thanks, man. You bet. We'll chat soon, hopefully, and I'll see you in Chicago, Michael. You got it. You bet. That's Mike Mayock. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern. On Audience.